Hello from the Advanced Swimming Performance Podcast, sponsored by Commit Swimming, the smartest workout log. Just type a set and Commit instantly calculates the data for you. To learn more, visit commitswimming.com. We highly recommend it. How are you, John? Oh, you know, I'm doing well. Just was looking on my what desk and, you know, I got four. Four, you heard it. Scissors four. on my desk. Here. That is so unnecessary, but all your cutting needs are covered. You know, we do do some cutting. We, you know, we do a lot of taping and things like that. But, you know, I, I, I will think I, – I think I might need to downsize a little personally. You know, that's just me. <laughs> Have you received I, any pictures to cut up and put in your locket yet? Maybe – you know, I, they have been that's, coming through. I've got a pile. Okay, um, good. That, that, uh, maybe that's maybe, – yeah, maybe I should keep them here until I, you know, I got to cut them out. Because I got to – the tough part, I think, I've got to cut it to a – to a heart, I think. To a heart, yeah. I mean, <laughs> good thing my intern just left. That sounds like intern responsibility there, you know. Oh, absolutely. Really, really positive skill set that needs to be implemented immediately. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll just put these scissors to the side. Hopefully I don't cut myself. But tell me, uh, I heard you were traveling to UK not too long ago, hanging out yeah, with Kenny yeah. PD and his high tempo breaststroke or what were you doing? Yeah, well, you were kind enough over break. He was uh, making fun of my teacup that I have here, which is 100% filled with coffee all the time. Oh, okay, there you go. But I did, I had an awesome trip. I spent um, just about a month there learning about, um, you know, how they view sports medicine and what they do within their different healthcare systems. And I got to work with some really great clinicians and, and just had a wonderful trip. But what I realized is just how important coffee and tea is there. And I, I fully appreciated it. I mean, when I said that I needed to take a break and have a midday coffee, it was 100% acceptable. And I also realized that any place I went, my friends are totally going to make fun of me right now, I had easy access to these sandwiches that I thought were just like the best thing in the world. Nice. I could get a smoked salmon and cream cheese sandwich at any point of the day, anywhere in the world, and it was really quite wonderful. <laughs> so shout out to everyone in the UK that fed me and gave me great coffee. <laughs> and there you go. Shout yeah, out to the UK. Yeah, now I'm back. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. actually have a recovering coffee caffeine addict in the house, our, our head strength coach, Chris Barber. He's got a reputation of training people at 4 a.m. over here. Yeah. And I don't know, he's been, you kicked off caffeine completely? Off it? Eight weeks? No, 10 weeks. 10 weeks? Man, right. he's going well, strong, going strong. Chris, but, I'm going to go ahead and be a bad influence. I'm going to send you some coffee because that is just crazy. That is not a good thing to cut out hey, here. We got coffee here. We got, we got all our, <laughs> you know, all organic coffee um, with our nice little story of where it's from in the in the office back here. But yeah, yeah he, he's kicked it. I mean, he was uh, he was drinking a lot of caffeine. I, uh, I remember him coming in with uh, maybe a jar this big and I'm like, oh, you got a nice coffee there? He's like, oh, no, it's just all espressos. I'm like, okay. Yes, That's all the right. Real deal. That's the real deal. <laughs> all so, right. Yeah. If you if you ever have either of us, it sounds like whoever's hosting is going to be supplying a lot of coffee, for the record. You got it. <laughs> you got it. If, if not, you better watch <laughs> out. That's the big one. All right. We're talking rotator cuff today. Yep, rotator cuff. So, obviously, the rotator cuff is – something that most in the swimming community have at least heard before. Yep. But why don't you break down um, the rotator cuff in general terms for us here? And I'm going to go grab my shoulder model while you go. Yes, do that, because that's actually going to make it more effective. Um, so the rotator cuff is actually four small muscles that help provide stability for what's known as the glenohumeral joint. So that glenohumeral joint is ultimately – where the head of your humerus attaches into what's called the glenoid fossa. So we have that ball, yep, and it sinks right into the socket. That creates our joint. So then the body, because it's so brilliant, created a support structure around it to support that movement, and that is ultimately what the rotator cuff is. So the shoulder joint for all of our coaches really interested and passionate about improving their anatomy training. Our shoulder allows us to have movement in all three planes of motion, which means that we can move everywhere, right? As opposed to the knee where we can really only move in, in terms of a front and back standpoint, unless we go and tear our ACL. Um, the shoulder allows us to, to be able to do every single stroke that we have within swimming. Um, so the rotator cuff, when it's most effective, is providing stability for that joint. 
What unfortunately happens is when our mechanics go or our training is a little bit off course and we start to expect the rotator cuff to be a main source of power. Yep. What do you think about that? I thought that was pretty darn good. I missed well, the there you go. getting my tools <laughs> and little props. So we have our shoulder like you were describing. And I decided to bring the spine. You know, maybe we'll get As you should. thoracic rhythm, you know, all types of fun stuff. We'll see what, what kits in store here today. So, well, you know, one thing is the rotator cuff is obviously an area that is injured frequently in yep. swimmers. Um, you hear of impingement where a rotator cuff muscle, um, mainly in primary impingement, the um, supraspinatus is getting impinged on the top of the shoulder where it's just getting rubbed. We also have posterior impingement, which I find to be the most common actually in swimmers where the posterior rotator cuff, um, oftentimes the infraspinatus, but you know, sometimes it's the whole posterior cuff bundle here is being impinged underneath the back of the shoulder. Um, those are the, the common areas that get aggravated. So it's easy to think, well, what can we do to help prevent these injuries? Strengthen the rotator cuff. Yep. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what the common, you know, strengthening strategies are and maybe some problems or areas that you think these could be improved for some coaches. Yeah. What we have, whoever's working with the kids. Yeah, yeah. I, for better or for worse, I typically will push the clinical diagnosis of swimmer shoulder as being a little bit lazy. Um, yep, I, I do. <laughs> um, I typically will also see supraspinatus tendonitis as being just a catch-all when really it's not. It happens to be the symptom of a problem rather than the problem itself. Mm -hmm. um, so when I am actually working with um, an athlete that's beginning to ha suffer from some symptoms, um, and whether that symptom is performance uh, changes or whether it's actual pain, whether, you know, burning, numbness, whatever, we will actually let the rotator cuff be and start to look at other mechanical issues that are probably setting the stage for those symptoms to then come out. And we found that uh, your the deep core stabilizers that should be activating during a body roll, um, as well as the mid trap and the lat are oftentimes underactive during the part of the stroke cycle where they should be your main force creators. So I think when we actually approach the topic of rot rotator cuff issues, we should uh, remove anatomy out of it, actually, and understand what muscles should be the prime movers and what muscles should be the supporters. And ultimately, when we take a look at anatomy, all the, all the big names aside, you have big muscles and you have small muscles. And uh, when I was, when I was being an adjunct professor, I always asked the, the students, would you ask a small muscle or a big muscle to do a huge amount of work? You know, which one do you think would be most effective? And overwhelmingly, obviously, you want a large muscle to do the main force production. And I think, you know, breaking everything down to the very, very basics, you want your large muscles doing force production, you want your smaller muscles being the support system. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime I hear rotator cuff, no matter who we're talking to, that's that's the stage that I set. What do you think about that? No, I think that's huge, man. I think you nailed it right on the head is that the rotator cuff may be, you know, an area that's that's damaged, but mm -hmm. it likely isn't the issue. What is putting all this extra stress on the rotator cuff? Is it something biomechanically due to some muscle tightnesses? Is it yep. something biomechanically due to weaknesses, like you said, of some of the, the bigger muscles in, in the system here? Or is it something with the motor control or the actual control of the motion and, and that something that needs to be addressed? Um, you know, learning the skill of the kinesthetic sense of the shoulder, which can be really huge because we know that at the end of practices, during fatigue, it's pretty obvious. You lose yep. that sense of position. That's why biomechanics start to fault and something that needs to be improved to help prevent some of these issues. So when it gets into rotator cuff strengthening, some of the, the bigger errors I start to see are people, and that's re re regards to clinicians, strength coaches, swim coaches, doing all, all the band motions, okay? Yep. They're doing all the band internal, external rotations, yep. an even number of internal and external rotations. What do you think about that approach and how that is for rehab or even prevention? I think all those people should be listening to this podcast. <laughs> oh, there you go. Level four eight. Tick, 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 tick. I bet you our, our friends at Commit Swimming would like 
Absolutely. That's right. Commit. If you need a better way to log your swim workouts, you should absolutely check out Commit Swimming. Commit is the most advanced workout journal that coaches and swimmers across all levels are now using and probably an effective tool to share with your rehab and performance staff. Why? Because it tracks your workout history, analyzes trends in your training, and most importantly, is extremely easy to use. All you have to do is type your workout like you would a Word document, and everything else is automatically taken care of for you. Try it for free at commitswimming.com. Um, yeah, so for all of the new clinicians that probably just spiked <laughs> into listening to this, um, go back to the very basics of, of clinical creativity. I think um, unless you are have a clinical background and you also have a swimming background aquatic athletes can be really intimidating because mm -hmm. you just don't know what to do with them um and really if you take the water component out of it um and just look at the movements of this athlete you will see that time and again they are doing overhead motion they are typically spending longer times in a flexed position they are doing much more force production with in internal rotation. So for our coaches, that means that they're trying to get maximum power output while uh, they are bringing some motion more towards the midline of their body, so that belly button line. Mm -hmm. And when you go in and create an exercise program, that does not equate to equal amounts of internal and external exercise. Um, and if you have full body movement, like we do in swimming, and overhead motion continually happening, that does not equate to internal and external rotation consistently time and again three sets of 10 or three sets of 12 we have to be a little bit more creative about that and how do you actually work within that entire scapular plane um, and support the fact that more flexion is occurring rather than or more flexion and internal rotation is occurring rather than extension and external rotation um, so that's where i stand on that <laughs> yeah i like that too <laughs> Young swimmers, um, I think it's 12 or 13, have been shown to have muscular imbalances already occurring. So this is important to start offsetting one to keep help them in, maintain proper um, posturing, which can be important for decreasing um, shoulder stress throughout the day. We'll call it shoulder hygiene. If you're walking around like this all day, I love that. Add up, add up, add up, add up. I one. love that. Good shoulder hygiene throughout the day. And if they are having all these imbalances, it's really going to be tough for them to do it. So being able to offset some of these imbalances really is going to be crucial and something that needs to be done early. And then, like you said, not just doing man and man and man, all these yep. things. Kids will do this and cheat their way through it, not even activate the rotator cuff. Have yep. them feel the muscle. Have them feel it contract. Have them feel it get firm in their hand. That's really huge and something that we use with kids as young as 11, 12. They can feel when something gets firmer. They're, they're not dummies. They may be yep. silly, but they're not dummies. So yeah. you can go ahead and get them to feel that and then try to get them to integrate it within their body. Oftentimes we'll see kids doing um, rotator cuff, like I said, and they'll be arching their back, compensating, make sure they're doing it correctly, make sure they're able to do it in motion where they're moving their uh, shoulder blade as well because the shoulder blade is oftentimes, from my experience, the area that needs to be focused on most for strengthening because the shoulder blades really are the foundation of the shoulder. If you have instability with this foundation, you're going to be having a lot of issues. So we need to strengthen, build up that shoulder stability. And that doesn't mean doing, you know, wise eyes and T's where you're arching your back and yeah. cheating through it. It's really being able to do these while you're integrating within the body and during movement. Well, and this is a conversation that I really want to see happen more and more is posture. Mm -hmm. Swimmers need to be concerned with their posture, both on land and in water. Every eight-year-old should be beginning to hear about their posture in water from the very, very beginning. That should be a mandatory part of every warm-up, of a point of focus during every set, because ultimately, if you have bad posture while you're swimming, it's only going to negatively support that completely internally rotated uh, position. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we see a lot about, you know, the whole upper cross syndrome when, when swimmers are on land, but really more conversations about their complete posture while they're swimming and while they're going through each one of the sport specific movements is going to support a healthier shoulder entirely. So yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's these little things and, and it's not even just for injury prevention. You know, if the athlete can be in a, a good posture in the water, they're going to be creating more drag and yep. that's going to slow them down. So it's, it's a bigger thing. And I know obviously coaches want to keep them healthy, but they want their kids swimming fast. So it has that performance aspect as well. Absolutely. Can you give one exercise that you would want a strength coach to incorporate in order for healthy shoulders to occur? Uh, what age are we working with? Let's, oh, that's a good point. Let's go with a 12 year old. You know, in all honesty, a 12 year old, what we'd be getting them started with is one, that simple thing, learning how to activate yeah. that posterior cuff is huge. And then something we'd probably be using just in the dynamic warm up is a, a wall slide position where they're tucking their hips, their heads back against the yeah. wall, and their arms are glued back, learning how to slide up and down. It's going to sound easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but it's certainly much harder, especially for those that may have forward head position or kyphotic back and yep. that can just help strengthen the posterior cuff as well as get the scapular muscles firing and it gives them a wall to push against so it gets some um, closed chain and extra muscular contraction which is a little easier typically to ease them in than something where their arms are in the in air yeah and for those of you that are listening and not watching our coaching staff kyphotic back is basically that rounded upper back position so we're trying to counteract that mm -hmm. i would ultimately again for that 12 year old i want all all things motor control motor activation and body awareness um oh. strengthening will come later the, mm -hmm. it's it's such an injustice to the the growing body to say that you want a 12 year old to pack on a ton of muscle and think they're just going to be super fast for it um I would want them to be able to get some adduction, a deduction in the scapular plane where they're both activating the lat as well as that posterior cuff mm -hmm. and mid trap. Getting that, that three tiered sequence really supports a good body position as well as that long term endurance for the entire rotator cuff to do its ultimate job, which is stability rather than uh, force production. Boom. Nailed there it. I go. couldn't agree more. Well, there you go. That is Rotator Cuff 101. I'm sure it won't be the last time we visit it. Um, but as always, it's good to be on the Advanced Swimming Performance Podcast. We can do better, swimming community. Let's help these shoulders. There you go. Have to snip them. <laughs> I love that. And on that note, we're out.